Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, and yo, by the way, written by Echoing Cascade. Chief Security Gasari was scrambling to put on his armor. He and his first response team had been called to secure 12 escaped Mysoran prisoners who had managed to board the station in the middle of the night. He was told that the escaped prisoners had entered the only open establishment in the promenade and had likely taken hostages by now. Sorry. What in the hell is open at this time anyway? One of the soldiers under his command checked his data pad and snorted. Soldier. Pandemonium. Gasari snuffed, putting on his armor as he did the rest of his team. He remembered the date and tried very hard, but failed to suppress a grin from forming on his face. Change your plans, newbie. Go get some snacks from the fridge. Someone hook up the pandemonium security cams in the situation room's main screen. This is, is going to be good. After they had taken place around the table and the security chief had made it very clear, that he hadn't seen his soldiers making bets. He started to eat some rather unhealthy snacks, and everyone went quiet as the show began. Teresa was an edge. Escaping from a prison transport would do that to a guy, but it wasn't his only source of unease. A few minutes ago, he and his fellow escapees had entered a darkly lit eatery, of some sort which was packed with sentient races, none of which he recognized. That alone would be worrisome, but the fact that they paid very little attention to twelve armed Mysorans kicking the door in, demanding that everyone lay down and continued eating and drinking, was worse. Now the bipedal creature behind the bar was approaching them with some sort of green liquid in large pints. Calm down, friends. Uh, first drinks on the house. After all, today everyone is a little higher. Before he could finish his sentence, Teresha shot him in the shoulder with a pulse carbine. A few gasps of shock and worry could be heard. They shot the barkeep. I know the crappy sells is overpriced, but dude, not cool. Barkeep, uh, good. Teresa, yes, this is better. That's how things are supposed to be. But to his ever-increasing dread, the voices in the dark started to sound angry and he could see fangs, claws, and hear the sound of weapons leaving their holsters. Barkeep! Avenge! Oh! You've fracked up now! Hi! Before Teresa could register, another member of the same species as the barkeep, wearing combat fatigues, materialized in front of him. He tried to point his carbine at the soldier, but the man in fatigues had already punched him below the armpit. He felt the bones crack, then break then shift inside his body and finally perforate some other rather important organs, at which point he flopped to the ground, twitching. The remaining Mysorans looked nervously at the scene unfolding, as the many customers began to get up from the seats. Oh, by the patriarch! He killed Teresa! The man who had just punched the de facto leader into a heap waved his hand in dismissal. Oh, uh, I didn't kill him. He's just in shock. While the other Mysorans let out a sigh of relief, the Marine lifted his boot off the ground and then brought it down on Teresa's neck with a sickening crunch. See ya! Now he's dead. From the corner of the dark ceiling, a slimy pseudopod extended towards the door, locked it, and destroyed the fragile mechanism. The eleven Mysorans were now in a circle, shooting all around them in a blind panic. Someone put some music on, would you? No one upset neighbors. From the bar stereo, an old earth song by the House of Pain began to blare. You see, I'm Irish, but I am not a leprechaun. You want to fight, then you step up, and you'll get it on. You'll get a right real grill. I might, and I'll ill. A descendant of Dublin with titanic skill. Gasari chuckled as he turned the feed off. He could hear some very heated discussions on who won the bet and what constitutes cheating behind him. Only bar that specializes on death world of food and drink in the sector, and these poor sods had to go and shoot the bartender on St. Patrick's Day. 
Oh well, we'll pick up what's left in the morning. End of story. Story number two. How the Galaxy Wages War. Written by Kennel. The Zile is bored, but the broadcasts say that he shouldn't be for long. His job as a janitor and a fabricator is mind-numbing, sweeping up stray nanite dust, mucking out the heat sinks and dumping the waste back into the hopper. Oh sure, it is an important job. His fabricator makes fully 5% of the disposable drinking tubes his home world uses. He shakes his head as he stands in the tube transit train, speeding towards his stop for home. He doesn't want to think about his work right now. No, he wants to think about the war. The latest season of war starts today, after all. Last season ended with quite an upset, with the Lingots coming from behind with an amazing display of coordinated explosives and troop movements to totally serve the Vrytel's paratroopers' air belay. Even better, the latest spacefaring race has had war declared on them. The humans are definitely the underdogs of season two. Everyone has seen the dull design of their, uh, everything. Drab greys and greens and browns, and not a sequence or tassel in sight. Don't they know how to intimidate the foe into surrender like the rest of the galaxy? Still, the Zyle had a suspicion that the humans had something planned. After all, they're a predator species with no discernible natural weapons. They wouldn't be the first ambush predators to do well in the war, if they do well. And that's why he moves as quickly as his five legs will allow him once he exits the tube train. He'll have just enough time to prepare something unhealthy to enjoy while watching the show. As the challenged, the humans had the right to choose the battleground and the duty to build the stadium for the war. They chose an odd design and location too. The stadium was large enough for 10,000 seats and other various platforms for moderately comfortable relaxation, but it also left large gaps of blank wall and floor between sections. The Grohl didn't mind this though. They'd be perfect places to set up an artillery and give a good show. And give a good show they do, their army marchers stepping perfectly together, firing at targets at the exact same moment. And for the finale, they break apart into smaller regiments and move with precision choreography to avoid the massive fireballs their artillery rain down. The crowd cheers at the display, knowing the humans have little hope in topping that. The Gorel were the champions for two seasons ago, after all. They certainly aim to start off on the right tentacle this season too. Still, the crowd quiets as the lights start to dim, signaling. The humans are going to begin their battle soon. It takes a few moments for the crowd to realize the lights can't be dimmed. This is an outdoor stadium. They have to dim the star. Eyes and other various photoreceptors are pointed skywards and see the local star is dimming and the light is being blocked out by the human fleet. And the telltale twinkling of the ship's fire accompanies a song that starts to play. The first impacts of orbital bombardment sinking perfectly with the flare of the trumpets. The timing was impressive, but the impacts are far outside the Colosseum, lessening the ability for the audience to truly appreciate them. An orbital lance spears down into the center of the arena and soon separate into many orbiting lasers from above. The gaps between the sections of the seating become obvious as the lances pass through them, vaporizing the dead space and leaving just the occupied stands. The very ground seems to rumble to the rhythm as the crowd feels the impacts below them, and those at the stage edge can confirm that the others felt. Tanks have rammed the supports, and the stands now sit atop war machines, their wide balls playing the bass beat as they turn their treads in opposite directions, facing the crowds towards the outside, rather that in. The arcs of lightning tear great wounds into the surroundings as they sing the song in a display of power and precision. Electronic and sonic hurts creating a dichotomously sweet voice over the distraction. The words promising terror 
Armies of horrors march in a terrifying and slow cadence with the music. Why should they hurry when their prey has nowhere to run? They get close together, chant the bombardment and the music momentarily quieting to let the soldiers' promise of doom to be clearly heard. The macabre march, never missing a beat of a single boot. The final orbital strike lands on the horde's laugh. Lo, a terrifying. The Zyle stares at the screen. His forgotten snack, now warmed to room temperature. Star of wonder, he swears. Still processing what he just saw, the show breaks to commercial, and once back, the same horror soldiers are helping the audience down from the stands in the background, the host of the war giving the human general an interview. Well, uh, that was quite an impressive start to the season, General. Uh, do you have anything to say to what would ask surely of billions of new fans? The general thinks for a moment and then nods. That is us being nice. When those Glorals declared war, we were getting ready to do that to their manufacturing. And then we got the contract in the mail. In the end, we figured this was a good idea. After all, if we can put them in their place without actually killing any of them, well, uh, that'll be a magnum opus to the art of war. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it, click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thanks to the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia, Barky, Fudic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Onholtz, White Band 420, Lord Asrakal, Arcalian, and Oakfield.